Hi. Hello. Is that us? Hi. Yeah, yeah, that's us. Hello. Uh, how's Hello. it going today? Pretty good. Uh, would you like to introduce yourself? I, I would. Is my screen sharing? Uh, yes, but I guess, yeah. Okay, there we go. Oh, there we go. Okay. Yeah. So, me, I'm Christina Cornett. I'm also very nervous, so bear with me. <laughs> this is my first stream with Christian. I'm glad to be here with you. Um, I am a concept artist working at Zenimax Online Studios. Disclaimer, none of my opinions or <laughs> anything I say is reflective of the opinions of the company. Yay, now that that's yeah. out of the way. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I'm here with Christian. Um, there might be a surprise special guest at some point. Uh, very special to me, just like this person here. Um, and John and Jackson, Jackson is John's dog, are in the shadows supporting us. So shout out to John and Jackson. Um, so yeah, what we're doing, we are doing some character design stuff. So fun with character design. Maybe at some point we'll draw Christian. I don't know. We'll cool. see. Excited. Um, <laughs> Very excited. Yeah. I'm excited too. Uh, she will be answering your questions. Um, there is uh, supposed to be a banner on top. It's uh, proco.com slash uh, 613. I will be reading the questions from there and uh, asking them to Christina. Um, yeah, so you're, you're a character designer currently working in video games, right? Uh, well, I kind of do whatever they need me to do. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, Zenimax? Yes, Zenimax Online Studios. They do yeah. um, Elder Scrolls Online. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we are doing a very different style from Elder Scrolls today. <laughs> so previously I did this a uh, couple years ago. I did this Manifest Westiny outlaw design. Um, and I really liked it. And just kind of kept going with it because it was really therapeutic for me to do. Um, so I'm going to be doing that today since I'm really nervous and need something therapeutic to work nice. on. Yeah, and I cool. kind of, uh, my friend Scratch kind of suggested, because um, I was talking about how I was looking for reference and this guy called Mongo from Blazing Saddles. I don't, I, I think I've watched it at one point, but I don't, I honestly don't really remember it. But I looked him up and he has a really great face. Um, I'm just kind of, he's kind of inspiring, but I don't even, I don't know if I'm going to go in that direction. We're just going to have fun today. Um, and I kind of have this concept of like a bomb character. I want a, a demolitionist of some kind to fit in with this little group here. Yeah. So I'm just going to move that to the side. Cool. And we're going to start drawing. Nice. Cool. Yeah. Um, would you like the first question? Just a. Uh, sure. Sure. Cool. Uh, what's your favorite kind of character to design? I like drawing wacky characters with weird teeth. <laughs> I don't know, maybe because I had really like awful teeth when I was a kid. Um, and I had braces for a few years. And I don't know, I think I think people and in, in characters with like goofy teeth, they just kind of make me happy. I think also too, when I was in college, um, there's this really talented artist in my class called, uh, her name was, her name is Elora Lida. I never remember how to say Lit Lida. I think it's Lida. And she did, um, she did these characters with like really, they were really cute characters with, you know, funny teeth and they're just really cute. You know, like when a character has like the little smiley face and yeah. like, how cute is that? Anyway. Um, so I'm not really going to hold myself to um, a, like a very rigid process today because I kind of just, this is kind of just something I'm going to do for relaxation. Um, but I was kind of thinking last night about maybe doing some kind of character that's really on the nose with like <laughs> a bomb shaped head. Um, I don't know, maybe it's a bit obvious, but I really like the idea of like some crazy kid like running and I don't know, maybe this is actually his hat. 
don't know. I'm just kind of I'm just kind of getting my ideas out right now. Yeah. Of what I'm thinking about doing, but I'm not going to hold myself to it. Right. And, and at this stage, you're just kind of trying everything, right? You're just being very experimental, not necessarily, you know. Yeah. 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 I just want to get my ideas down and just going to have him over here for now. Um, and kind of the reason I want to, can I paste this in here? Kind of the reason I want to do that is like, I want to have, I have a lot of, larger characters i think it would be fun to have a little guy in here maybe yeah. i think he would fit in the lineup really nicely yeah um so yeah so i'm actually going to start off with silhouettes and the reason why is because for me personally i know not everybody works this way but for me i feel like i get a better freedom in just kind of searching for the shapes. Um, I found when I was like first starting art, it was hard for me to go from silhouette to final drawing. And that was because I was focusing too much on like, oh, I have to be perfect to the silhouette. Um, but I don't really do that anymore. Now it's just kind of this silhouette is going to inspire me. So I'm not going to I'm not going to hold myself to the silhouette either, personally, is how I feel about it. But I'm just going to start with shapes. And what I'm doing is I'm using the lasso tool. And if you hold down shift, you can keep on adding shapes. Oh, sticky keys. Yeah, you kind of have to be careful about that, too. Uh, and what I'm doing when I'm searching for shapes is Right now, when I'm starting out, I'm trying to find something that feels right to the character that I want to design. Like, I kind of imagine someone a little crazy because all of the people in this family are a bit crazy. Um, the way I've imagined them is they are butchers and they run a butcher shop. Um, so yeah, they're kind of the villains in this story. Mm. This kind of looks like a mini Mad Hatter, and I, I kind of like that feeling, yeah. like um, the Willy Wonka sort of Mad Hatter. Yeah. yeah. But like for me and the style that I enjoy working in on my downtime, um, I just love little stuff that sticks out. But as I'm going like, okay, I've got this silhouette here, and, you know, I'm kind of noticing that, you know, some some distances are not that dynamic. Like we've got this head shape here, which is about the same size as this body. And it just, it just kind of bugs me. So I'm just going to put him over to the side and I'm just going to keep going with stuff that might be similar, but you know, not exactly. And I'm kind of imagining like, you know, what's he doing? Like in my head, I'm imagining him maybe crossing his arms. He's like, hmm, I want to blow something. Oh, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> he wants he wants to blow something up. Yeah. Not me. I'm very anti blowing things up. Oh, God. I hope nobody from the FBI is watching. <laughs> You're OK. <laughs> But yeah, this, this guy kind of looks fun. Um, and, and the nice thing about working in silhouettes is like, it's so quick when you get used to it. I don't like this eraser tool for what I'm doing. I'm gonna get something a little quicker right now. I have it on um, transfer. I wanna have it on a harder erase. There we go. But yeah, I, I really like it. Um, uh, I was friends back in the day with a bunch of people on a Google Hangouts. Um, and uh, I think Alan taught me, my friend Alan taught me how to work with characters in, in silhouette mode. And I just kind of kept going with it over the years because I don't know, some people like working in shape better and I think I'm one of them, but. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, I, I mean, it's, uh, it's 
cool to me seeing the diversity of workflows for professionals. Like a lot of people work in line, um, you know, they, they will build everything up from a mannequin. People will just scribble, people will, you know, use photos and, um, you know, pretty much the thing I've seen is uh, people use whatever works best for them to, mm -hmm. you know, get, get the work done. And, uh, yeah, and, and if it doesn't work, like sometimes I'll be working in silhouette and I'll be like, this isn't working for me. And I'll just switch to another method. Like I'll switch to line or I'll, you know, go back to gathering reference or something. Yeah. See, right now I'm just, now I'm holding myself, like I'm creating too much of the same thing over and over. And I don't think that's really going to help me in the end, but I still want, still want to keep that bomb shape, but maybe it doesn't have to be a traditional bomb. Maybe it's like, I don't know, dynamite. Yeah. So maybe he's got a dynamite shaped head. Um, but when I was a student, I would feel really bad because, you know, there are, um, there are like, you know, methods that are going to help you to design a character, but you don't always have to hold yourself to them. Like they're there to help you, but you know, if it doesn't help you, then the most important thing is that you have to find your own way. And for me, like sometimes silhouettes don't work sometimes just. I have to go to line. Yeah. Just sort of depends on what I'm thinking or how I'm thinking yeah, yeah. for that day or like, like my mood can affect anything. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what you ate for breakfast that morning and yeah. It's, uh, yeah. Like, am I feeling gassy today? You know, yeah. <laughs> I'm just kidding. It makes, a, makes a big difference. Well, I, was, I was listening to a lecture from uh, Craig Mullins and um, he said for his images he never he never starts the same pretty much every time he starts a new picture it's with a new process or a new program or you know trying to incorporate 3d or, or something you know it's, uh, i think that's really admirable like always yeah. kind of figuring out your um your process like i i know i i actually really admire people who have um set processes because like sometimes i feel like i don't or I don't plan it out as much maybe yeah. as I could. Um, and I think sometimes that might help me more to do. Yeah. 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 Um, well, and I, 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 I think it's one of those things where there are no rules to it. Like mm -hmm. uh, you can start consistently the same thing every time or same way every time or you know, do it differently. And yeah. I, I guess it's pretty much whatever, you, whatever the thing is that makes you feel the most creative. That seems like the, um, you know, the thing that people try and, uh, or I guess the place mentally that people try to get to the most. Yeah. I think, I think the biggest thing is feeling comfortable and, um, confident. Yeah. Like, um, if I'm not really feeling it in the morning, like if I'm feeling kind of eh, like if that what's imposter syndrome is hitting me that day, I'll, I don't think, you know, sometimes I won't do as good work. So like getting yourself in a good mental zone is essential to doing good work, at least for me. Um, yeah. And then sometimes I'll surprise myself and do something that I think is really cool and you know, that's, that's definitely a surprise <laughs> when that yeah. happens and I'm feeling kind of, eh. and right. then I'll feel a lot better. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I, I think it's also just having faith in the process of just, if you continue to create, uh, it'll, it'll, you know, eventually you'll make something that you, that you like. Yeah. One thing too, that I'm thinking of when I'm doing these characters is, um, yeah, these guys are crazy, but they're also a little bit evil. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I still have a lot of round shapes going on in here. So he's not really that evil looking. But I think I'm okay with that because, yeah, I don't know. Maybe I should make him more pointed because when I look at my reference picture, of these outlaws. Um, let me slide that over there. They're 
not really round. There's a lot of um, pointy lines and I'm not really following that with what I'm doing so much. But who knows, that's not necessarily a bad thing because maybe he's the most friendly one out of all of them. Then again, like the traditional bomb isn't, <laughs> it's a round shape. So yeah, I mean, yeah. Right. there is that, so, but. Yeah. I kind of I kind of like the craziness of this. He feels like a Dr. Hyde sort of thing to me. Yeah, I think I I'll definitely. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh no, no, sorry. I was I was agreeing with you. I think once it gets into the interior shape. I'm not going to do too many more of these just so that I can get through more of the process. But I think once it gets into like the interior um, shapes like his face features and things like that. It should be, be fun. Like yeah. maybe he's holding something. Up. Maybe he's maybe he's lighting his own head. Oh man. <laughs> maybe that's what's going on here. I don't know. Maybe. I shouldn't make him tall because I feel like he wouldn't in the lineup. <laughs> it's like wouldn't look good. But I'm just so tempted. I really love doing like the long, thin, thin legs. Like if you look at my work, a lot of my characters that I do on my downtime have that stuff. Oh, see, I'm doing it again. It's just so fun because you get those giant boots on their feet. And yeah. like when you're working in purely silhouette, which I may do here. Um, it's just it's just a technique that I get a lot of freedom out of because I can't like not only do I sometimes have shaky hands but I, I really can't control this that well like yeah like sometimes if I get in there you know maybe it can but it's still like ooh a hand right but generally I don't try to to do that I just try to make it a freeing fun thing right. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think it's one of those things that it gets a readable character re really quickly too. You know, if you're, um, you know, if you let yourself play around with the shapes, it's, uh, so it generally gives you something that does does look really cool very quickly. Um, it really does. I, I've noticed that, like, um, when I do figure drawing, um, I get caught up in the minutia of form and, uh, you know, what things overlap, anatomy, and all that kind of stuff. And uh, when I only do anatomy studies, I kind of lose sight of the of the overall storytelling and shape of the character. And... Yeah, I feel like I get that way as well. Um, like if I it's kind of like gesture drawing, like you're not always trying to be incredibly accurate with the gesture. Like you might be trying to you might be trying to just get the pose from the gesture and then you go over it with anatomy. I feel like that's a way that works for me with this. Um, yeah. With this way of working. Maybe it's a girl. I don't know. Yeah. It says that demolitionists can't be women. This is yeah. 2021, yeah. darn it. <laughs> yeah, geez. Get with the program, Christina. Yeah. Um, would you like to answer a question? Sure. Um, hello, I want to ask how you balance details in a character design. Like, what's a good way to know if a character has too much or too little detail? I'm guessing that's like, how busy do you make your character question? Yeah. Or like where you choose to, um, I think some of it depends on the style that you're going for. But for me, I try to keep, I try to keep in mind that the areas of greatest contrast are where people are going to look. So if I have a lot of busyness in a coat or something, I try to contrast it like in the face is maybe a little bit more clear of detail. And then it's easier to kind of control where the viewer's eye is looking. Right. So, you know, you can do that with detail. You can do that with light or color. Um, you know, sometimes you might want to do it with multiple aspects of the character. Um, but I'm somebody who loves putting a lot of detail into my characters and like when I'm just doing it for fun I'm just like why not you know it has some buttons here let's add 20 more 
Um, but at some point, like, you may want to evaluate what, where you are really getting your, your character, um, where your area of focus is at, and then deciding more consciously where to put that detail. Right. Maybe I can do a little, maybe I'll do a little diagram on top of this guy. Nice. This guy being a, a gender neutral term for this character, because I'm thinking it might be crazy little, little lady. Okay, there's some arms, there's some quick arms. Yeah, so if you have like, ooh, nice detail. Wow, look at these buttons. And actually, did you know that, I think that um, men's shirts and women's shirts have buttons on different sides? Oh, I didn't know that. I think that's, I, I think that's actually the case. So when I, ever I do buttons, you know, I try to care about that. Generally, I don't, but if it's like, if it's supposed to be more, see now I'm just noodling because I'm talking, but if it's supposed to be more accurate, I do look it up, but I always forget. Um, so yeah, lots of detail. Ooh, nice detail. We lace. So nice. So I, I may not go in here and put like a ton of distracting detail. Um, like see, see how I'm kind of getting the lines to go up? I'm using like directional lines to kind of pull you up into this area. Um, but right now you're seeing like, like your eyes going straight towards that vest. So if we have some eyes in here, wow, nice eyes. Because there's so much simplicity in these arms and this head, all of the contrast is going to the vest. So I may actually add more detail on the arms. And then because your eye is so overwhelmed by everything else, see how it's kind of going more towards the skirt and the head now? Yeah. I don't, is that, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it does. So, you know, if that skirt doesn't really mean anything to this character, I might add some more trim on it. And then when I go into, and this is like if you're doing a lot of detail, like like I like to do. Um, right, right. Yeah, so then like, just for example, I'll just put more, even more stuff here. Like now your eye goes straight to the head um, because it's so overwhelmed by everything else. But like, that's a conscious decision that I made. Like right. I will be checking that over and over again. Right. Well, and to me, it seems like, um, you know, the, the way to be successful at that is keeping in mind the goals of the character, you know, like, what is the story of who this character is, you know, it's not like everything is in service of the story versus being in service of the drawing or, you know, trying to, you know, make, uh, yeah, yeah, to, you know, it's, it's, th there might be an impulse to make more detail to, um, make the character read better or to show people or something, but uh, often you can get away with a lot less than uh, you might expect. That's a setting. really good point. Yeah, like here I'm having the detail, I'm having the area of focus be the head because my idea is like to make the bomb and the head the same kind of shape. Um, but yeah, like Christian said, if, if you, like if the character's hands are the way that it like attacks or something um you may want to focus everything on the hands like maybe the hands are going to be bigger than the rest of the body or you're gonna you might have like contrasting colors there um to bring the the focal point to the hands i think yeah. i'm just going to pick one at this point so that we can keep going in the process cool um i actually kind of like the way this one turned out but there are some things I'm gonna change with it. So let's just, yeah. let's have her, let's take her. We can get rid of this man. She looks friendly. She's got some tattoos on her arms. Very, very young to have tattoos on her arms, I think. Yeah. Um, but whatever, maybe they're temporary. 
maybe they're just a fun design. I, I, I don't I don't want to interject into your character, but it, it feels like a you know Mexican Day of the Dead a little bit to, to me. It really does. I, I like it a lot. I love those designs as well. Yeah. Um, I'd have to pull a lot of reference for those two though to make it. Oh yeah. To yeah. give it justice. <laughs> Right. Which I'm not sure that I that I will be able to do in this time, but um, I I love the Day of the Dead stuff. Like I actually was considering bringing my I had a I had um, a cup that's really like inspired by that those artistic motifs, but I decided to go with my SpaceX mug because right. I know that you also have one. I didn't bring it today. I'm sorry. I totally should have. How could you do this? <laughs> it's at uh, Scott Flinders' house right now. Oh, is it really? Yeah, yeah. I hope he's. I hope he's using it and getting some sure, yeah, use out of it. <laughs> sure is. Um, uh, uh, you know who has uh, great opinions on storytelling? Marshall Vandruff. Marshall Vandruff. Oh, uh, is that so? It sure How is. is. He, oh, Marshall oh, yeah. Vandruff! What a surprise! <laughs> yeah, who, who would have expected this how did this happen i just i woke up and i found myself in a world that i'm not used to seeing myself in and you were here i thought it was a dream i think it is a dream <laughs> it might be a dream marshall vandruff and we're in the wild related. west <laughs> well let's see and john and jackson is john's dog in the shadows yes yeah well, I've been here the whole time. I saw that. I saw you hinting at that. <laughs> I've been You've watching. Been watching us. I've been being, yeah, a student and fan. Oh well, that's the same that I am for you. Well, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what was it's it? The real party what, now. What was it that prompted to bring me in here? What we was it? About what a, was the topic? We were talking about storytelling as it relates to character design. Yeah. And putting and putting contrasts and um, designing focal points to enhance the story was mm -hmm. a point that Christian made that is very helpful. Well, there and we go. just chose this uh, this character to join the McGraw lineup. Yeah, but. Uh -huh. I'm not going to follow the silhouette too much because I have yeah. some changes I want to make here. Just a rough idea. Oh, did I just press? I did press save. Maybe I should save this. Let's save this. What should I call it? Fun stream with Fun stream. friends. Yeah. Nice. And there it is. Fun stream with friends. How are you feeling about this world, Marshall? About this world, when you say the world in general, are you talking about the world that you're creating? Both. <laughs> what are your broad opinions on the universe? On the universe, yeah. I don't know that that's, that's a, a place to go. I think it would take it away from the immediate. <laughs> Christina, I'm just so impressed to see, uh, you know, out of, I, I've never watched you work. I guess and, you haven't. After all of these years, I've seen your work when you've, I show your work regularly. I showed your work just this last semester to the expressive drawing students. Thank show you. what you did in that class. And uh, okay. I, but I've never actually seen you work. And the thing I'm impressed with is your, your fearlessness, your no hesitating, your territory is the, the lasso tool and you're unafraid with what happens and you make judgments but you don't make judgments that slow you down i'm just very impressed to see it it makes me feel like oh i would like to do this and if you're doing <laughs> if you're getting that response out of a person watching you it seems likely that it's because you're at ease with this and having successes much more quickly than a person would if they were first starting out You've been at this, you've been working this way for how long? About four years, five years? Um, I think, I think my friend showed me the lasso tool when I was, I'm not going to say around well, seven it, years it, ago. Was it a long time ago, like before I knew you? Um, I 
think after I knew you. Okay, yeah, because I remember when you were seeking style changes, mm -hmm. that you were you were unhappy with your. I, I don't remember the words you used, but it was it was about style, and you were looking toward more uh, underground stuff. More uh, vulgarity was a year word you used. That you're, Did I you're, say that? Wow. I yeah, mean, yeah. It, because I, I, I kept using the word vulgarity about the underground uh, comic artists and how they they're unrestrained, they don't hold back, they put everything out there, they fill it with detail, and that there was a quality. Albert Durer was another one that that uh, came up in our conversations, and you were looking for a quality that would make. We had a, we had a number of adjectives, anyway. That was when you started experimenting around with fast silhouettes, as I recall. And then this seems like it would have been around 2016. But you, you've done that. You've got over that barrier. I'm, so the truth is, I'm actually terrified. I'm terrified everything's going to look terrible. But I've I, I, really, of... I really like watching you draw, Christina. It's really, oh, really thank cool. you. Yeah. Uh, I'm terrified, but I'm okay with it being bad. Oh, wow. <laughs> because I know, because like over the years, I've gained the confidence to know that I can fix it. Yeah. And like right now, I'm not so worried about it looking good as I am, you know, making sure that the shapes work together. But I think the lasso tool, like, I think the lasso tool, because I think at one point we talked about how like I know that you worked in pencil and you have a very um, like a tight style or you had one back in the day when you did those Alice in Wonderland mm -hmm. drawings. And we talked about like admiring the looseness of certain ink painters yeah. or draw drawing, you know, ink drawings um, like. Uh, Cly. Cly and uh, who's, who's that guy? I always forget his name, but you gave me a book on him. Uh, can you describe the artwork at all? Um, kind of creepy and loose drawing. Um, and I think he inspired Disney work as well. Oh, well, there's, there's a number of them. Um, there's Kai Nielsen. There was Dulac. There was Arthur Rackham. There was, uh, oh gosh. Heinrich Klein was the one, uh, well, D the Disney artists were, were big on a few of those guys. But uh, A.B. Frost was another. Uh, I do like A.B. Frost. Yeah. But um, but no, it's none of those. I'll I'll try to keep it in mind and then bring it up later. Okay. But um, but right now it's uh, oh, but yeah, but we were talking about that back in the day, and I think the lasso tool is kind of the equivalent of digital pen drawing for me because I have no control over it most of the yeah. time. Well, or little, little control over it. Like, I feel like I'm, I'm like, it is my, it is my master. <laughs> like yeah. I, sometimes it works with me and sometimes it doesn't, uh, but Christine, I like that. Christina, it was, uh, it was experimenting around with, uh, I remember even in the nineties, no, 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 not the nineties. It was about 2000, early 2000s watching concept artists discover exactly what you're doing. Wow. That's, that's just so nicely done Well, that. It, she's it's, it's got the qualities of the best television, uh, television design of the 1960s back when the, the animation had to be done simpler. That was in the age of the, the Flintstones and, and Rocky and Bullwinkle and and a lot of that stuff this is you've you have picked up those qualities and run with them beautifully it does look very jetsons kind of yeah the jetsons right <laughs> uh it's there's a simplicity to it that makes it accessible but there's also an edginess to it that makes it not all it's it's not altogether innocent it's anything but uh precious moments and yet you're working in a style that is is kid friendly you you pay a lot of attention to shape language, don't you? I do. Yeah, I really, I absolutely love working with shapes. And that's why, even though I know this might not look great, it's just, it's pure play right now. Yeah. Um, but some, like, 
I'll switch back between line and silhouette a couple times sometimes, like I'm doing right now. Yeah. Because I actually feel like I'm getting too safe with it. Yeah. And I want that fear of, <laughs> I, I, I want that, you know, lack of safety when I'm designing a, a weird looking character. And oh, then I'll bring, okay. I'll go back into my little safe zone later when I. Well, I, I love this character. I love I love uh, all the stuff that I mentioned. I want uh, the, the, the uh, so you're 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 willing to lose that, huh? The safety. The, the the you're no you're willing to lose the the facial expression that you just uh, obliterated. Oh yeah, I I actually erase a lot. Um, and you don't. So you are not trying to keep that one, that 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 facial expression you had before. It's not important you to to you to keep it. No. Like. Well, um, I think I think when you get to the point where where you feel comfortable being able to recreate something, uh -huh. I think that's like the best headspace that I can be at. Um, and yeah. like right now, I'm a little, you know, I'm a little, you know, I don't know if I'm gonna get something as good, but I'm okay with it because the most important thing for me right now is getting who this character is rather than like a perfect expression just yet. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty similar to your actual workflow, right? It's it's uh, not necessarily performance, but it's what you would actually be doing if you were, you know, designing a children's book or character or games or something, right? Yeah, like I want I want the story and I want the characters um, design to well, like you said earlier, like I want it to enhance the story and like I said, like she feels like a crazy kind of person. I don't know how crazy she is yet though. And that's kind of what I'm experimenting with. Like, right. She like, is she a psycho? Like, does she want to just throw around bombs or does she have a, <laughs> is she an unwilling participant that, you know, I don't know, maybe she's got a giant bomb on her head, just kind of carrying it around. We've got a motif going on here. <laughs> uh I realized that I, I wandered off. I wandered off the topic uh, by going to the 1960s animation stuff. The, the thing I wanted to mention was that discovering the lasso tool. A number of concept artists discovered that you just don't have as much control over it as you do when you clamp down and make specific decisions about a shape that you can micromanage. And the lasso tool offers enough randomness and in unpredictability it's a relationship where you can say what you're going to say but you don't know what's going to come out of the other person's mouth it's going to be a surprise lasso tool says i think i'll do this or this or this and and so those surprises get us out of our comfort zones mm -hmm. and and christina the most the most valuable thing that that you've said was just a few moments ago about I was so happy with the mouth that you had on this character <laughs> that I would have never sacrificed it. And when I watch my favorite concept artists work, when I watch the most creative people I know work, I see there is a difference between them and you, which is I I have, there's a fountain here. I've got to freeze this fountain. I've got to take a picture of this fountain. I've got to make sure that that moment of the fountain looking so good is, is held still forever. And in doing so, it means that the fountain does not continue giving. And your attitude is, hey, let's just, let's just continue exploring around and see what you like enough. to Do you come to a point where you fall in love enough with what you've got to where you say, I'm happy with it, or do you just run out of time? Um, I guess it depends on what I'm doing. Like mostly for work, I am running out of time. <laughs> but when I'm doing my own stuff, um, I usually try to go until I get to the point where I'm happy with it. But then even then, like it'll change during the process, which like you can't really do with work work as much. Yeah because you know you have to deliver something that they approve of but me like when i'm doing it one of my favorite things to say is why not so if i come up with an idea that is absolutely ridiculous sometimes i'll end up doing it like um do i have an example here 
Uh, let me open this page because I because I did I want to bring this up because I did a lot of like why nots on it. Uh huh. Um, and I know I did this years ago, but I felt really happy when I was doing this, so I go back to this a lot. Uh huh. Um, but let me go down here to this <laughs> this guy. <laughs> um, varmint. It was just like. I can't remember how this came up. I don't know if somebody gave me this idea or if I was just like rolling with it. Um, but it was like, oh, there's a possum under his hat. Why not? And then it just kept going and it works. Like, and then his name is Varmint. Uh -huh. well, it doesn't Varmint mean like, a, I don't know. Like, it's kind of like a rodent. I don't know. A, a creature, yeah. A creature. Yeah. Um, well, I guess it's pretty close to vermin too, so. Yeah. But yeah, it's just, and then like, oh, he's riding a fake horse. Like, I, I like to, when I'm designing goofy characters, which I guess this is what this is, yes. a lot of it is why not? And I feel comfortable erasing it. And this is really for like um, my enjoyment. So I'm really the only person I have to please. But I think, I think even if you're working and you're having fun with it, you're going to get a lot better results. Christina, you are a concept artist. We we did not, I don't know that we ever uh, saw it that way years ago, but your, your temperament, your attitude is the attitude of a concept artist. There are so many students who say they want to be concept artists and they have uh, the, the attitude of locking down too quickly. I think that if people are here as students, and I think a lot of people are here as students as well as fans, uh, that if you did not, in the last two minutes, if you did not write down physically with a pen, pencil or marker or whatever else, if you did not write down the, the, the two words, why not, question mark, maybe even put an exclamation point after it, then you are not making use of what you're getting uh, from this. That is a great phrase. It's a guiding maxim. It, yeah. it, switch, it switches away from fear mode to let's give it a shot mode, which is exploring, which is creative. Are you putting little braces on the teeth? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Why not? Exactly. Like, you know, you could mention, I wonder, are people still writing in the chat? Maybe if they mention something, I can add it to the picture. Yeah, yeah. I will, so, uh, as a testament to why not, like an accessory or something. <laughs> Bless you. Thank you. Sorry. What did you sneeze? I did sneeze. Yeah. Oh yeah, I heard a sound, but I wasn't sure it was a sneeze because, but when you sneeze over a microphone like that, it can come out so distorted that it's sort of like, sort of like the lasso tool that can mess around with what you're doing. The sneeze was, well, bless I you. Wanna, I want to, I want to show one of my favorite tools to use that I don't know, I didn't really know about it much as a student, but I started using it this way. And this is like a really fun way for me to mess with proportions. <laughs> I love using the liquify tool. It unifies lines too, doesn't it? it? It sort of builds in some continuity and flow to it. It really does. I think it's a really, uh, it's a, it's a great tool to experiment with. And it's just like, that's so quick. And now uh, I'm just I, making it crazier. I have some, I have some uh, suggestions from the chat. Oh, okay. Um, somebody says add a taco. Um, somebody <laughs> also says maybe she burned off her eyebrow in an explosion. Mm. Oh, that's, that's People a really great idea. Thinking through story now. Mm -hmm. I have a question for you when when it's appropriate, but I don't want to distract you from your flow. Oh, no, go ahead. Yes, but, uh, no hair as well. Just, uh, oh, just kind of keep, keep the yeah. look. One thing I noticed you do is that when you were using the, the liquify tool, it, it is the liquify tool, right? Mm -hmm. uh, when you were using it, you started to move in the direction of making her more symmetrical and then you pushed it way the other direction was that a conscious awareness that i'm making it more mirrored try the other way or was it instinctive um i think a little bit of both because at one point when i started learning about um doing symmetry and asymmetry in my work 
um, I had to like consciously start doing it. Mm -hmm. I think at this point it's a little more subconscious, but yeah. I still sometimes have to remind myself. Um, and I think it's even more important for this character yeah. because she's kind of crazy. Yeah. Um, wow. That she is more asymmetrical. And sometimes I'll do this with, you know, drawing. Sometimes I'll do this with lasso. And sometimes I'll, you know, I feel like doing it with liquefy. And, and it might even be a combination of all three. But right now, like, I'm doing this to find the flows of the character. Yeah. Well, you did it so fast. And you were talking about something else while you did it. That's why I asked is that I think you've got it into your impulses of the difference between symmetrical and asymmetrical and the value of each. I yeah. recommend to students that that's another thing you have in front of your face in training is as you did, where you're consciously aware, where is it symmetrical? Where is it not symmetrical until it gets drilled down into just feeling. Mm -hmm. And, you know, don't feel bad if you have to keep reminding yourself because, I mean, people have to remind them. I, I still have to remind myself all the time about it. But sometimes, you know, it will be more instinctive. And then sometimes you'll have to, like, really work to remind yourself. Um, yeah. Like, oftentimes when I'm drawing characters, I try to make sure that, like, for example, if I was drawing a character with these proportions, I would not feel like I was as successful with this character because if you look at it, the proportions are really similar. Mm. And I try to avoid that. So then I would go and I would redraw it and then really like push those proportions. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I just keep going. That's great. But, yeah, it's not it's not a bad thing too if you're you know, if you're wanting to make um if like if your style is a little more tame in the proportions, but it's good to be conscious of when things are are looking a little bit too uh samey as far as the sizes because like we talked about earlier, contrast is important for bringing focus to where you're going to look on a character and if like the shapes are all the same size, then, you know, you might have trouble doing that. Well, it's so nice to hear you say that and not uh, and not demonize it, because like you mentioned, you, you're you can't know how how much to throw off the proportions until you've thrown them off. So you just make it a point to throw them off. Mm -hmm. I like I like testing things out and like sometimes sometimes it saves me time and sometimes it it doesn't, so I have to kind of pick and choose when I do stuff like this. Mm -hmm. But I like to, if I can, I like to spend as much time as I can in the design phase because I can render in this style a bit faster mm -hmm. than I can design. And I'm more worried about my designs being, um, wow. like helping with the story than I am about the rendering. You got your priorities straight. Also, this doesn't most of your work get modeled or handed over to someone else to turn it into the things that that move or get rendered by a, by 3D or whatever else? Um, generally, I think that's the case. Like some of the projects I've worked on, um, I've had to prepare everything myself. So then I would have to spend more time from beginning to end, like making sure it's rendered nicely. But mm -hmm. if you're just doing a concept, then somebody's going to be picking it up um, after you anyways. So yeah, what so I'm doing the, here is, oh, sorry. The, the rendering is not the most important thing. You are that you are making the design. Yeah, like in when I'm doing, at least for me, when I'm doing work work, the idea is the most important and the rendering will just enhance the idea. Yeah. Like it doesn't have to be beautiful. One thing my coworker Scratch says is uh, finished, not perfect. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I've had to follow that mantra a lot because like I'm working for work, I'm working in a style I never really practiced for. Mm -hmm. 
in school because it's like Elder Scrolls Online. It's more like serious, realistic proportions. So um, people on my team are really, really nice and helpful. Anyway, I'm just noodling at this point and I don't feel like I'm getting anywhere. So well, you were you were you started to say something and I had I had uh, interjected something at the moment. Was there a, a place you were going? Oh, yeah. Um, well, I like the idea that the that somebody said of a, a singed eyebrow. That was really fun. Huh? Um, I have some other suggestions as well. If you're oh, sure. Uh, somebody recommended a uh, people recommended a pet like a chameleon on her shoulder or something. <laughs> that um, would be fun. Maybe they're singed too. Yeah. <laughs> uh, fireworks, a tattoo. <gasps> fireworks. That's cool. Maybe yeah. the tattoo is of a firework. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe she's really inspired by, I don't know, anything explosive. <laughs> maybe she has kind of running with that idea. Like maybe the fireworks are making a skull and crossbones. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah like, uh, I'd have to look up reference of fireworks, but I'm just going to draw this idea here because I think that's really fun. And then this is like the bomb lighting. Oh, you know what? I kind of like that silhouette. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'll make that her head. <laughs> but yeah, I, um, I'm going to move on from this because I'm just noodling a lot. But I mean, that's OK, because like this isn't really like a work workflow. But I mean, it could be. But I'm just trying to work on designing something fun. I love watching it. Thanks, Marshall. You know, I learned a lot of this stuff in school with you and with Phil. Yeah, you picked up the kid energy of, of I'm just going to do what I feel like doing. <laughs> <laughs> I really admire that about kids. Like, I think we actually talked about kid drawings and and we were I think we were like looking at them one day or or we brought ours in. I can't remember what it was, but I love how they can I love how they can just like take an idea and make something ridiculous and it's the coolest thing ever to them. Yeah. I just really like that energy. Yeah. It's joy in the doing of it. It's joy in the product too. It's joy in here's what I did, but there is so much joy in the doing of it. Uh, Phil, by the way, I, I don't know. He wanted to be here. He said he'd be here in a second, except that he's driving uh, Phil's coming. with his family home from vacation. So he's on the road right now. Oh my gosh. Well, I hope the... we wouldn't want to have him set up with a, with a live stream while he's in the process of driving his family on a highway. That's really nice of him to to come by when he's he wanted right to make, his vacation. He wanted to make sure that you knew that he'd be here in a second. Those were his exact words. Ah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so he, he he's not coming today, right? But yeah. He, he would, uh, but we'll, yeah, we, yeah. we could work something out. Yeah, yeah. Phil, sure. Phil is such an energetic teacher that uh, and. I, I, you know, I, what, what is it? How do people know about Phil? Is it VizDev Phil? Is that the way he goes? Um, I'll look up his Instagram. He, yeah, he has you. a YouTube yeah. channel. Yeah. Phil's one of the, Phil's like one of the examples I still look back on is like being an adult that has that kiddish energy when you come to creating things. Like he always just like comes up with ideas like what if we do this and what if we do that and what if it has like a little thing on its head he he gets so excited about ideas and yeah um if you would like to look up phil his youtube channel is phil's design corner phil's design corner right uh and we were talking about phil dimitriotis phil dimitriotis phil dimitriotis i met when he was just out of high school and now he's my supervisor at the community college and uh we'll 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 speak to you together publicly someday <laughs> yeah phil emphasizes the ideating stages mm -hmm. very much and working in silhouette and exploring and and trying it many different ways and and 
it's great to see this. Yeah. I'm having a lot of fun with it. Yeah, yeah. And all the ideas that people put in the chat are really cool. Like the um, somebody said no hair, and it makes sense because if you were a demolitionist, you probably burned your hair off. Yeah. Or maybe even part of your hair. That would even reinforce the uh, the asymmetrical look. I think as this comes to a close in an hour, that the pe uh, people who have been writing down maxims like why not and vary it up and be aware of too much sameness. It wasn't saying never use too, mu too much sameness. It was if you start out with too much sameness, vary it up and be aware of that spectrum. Those kinds of those little bits of wisdom might be worth that right toward the end everybody types into the uh the chat what the most valuable notes were i'd be interested yeah but i mean this is my first stream so i'd be really curious what helped people um do you make a, a new layer for each shape then so that you can move it around um, yeah, I do that for if I want to move something around, but also for when I'm setting up painting. Like normally I'll label these, I probably should. And you just label them pants, arm, head? Yeah. Um, and that gives you the, the flexibility to mess with them independently of the other, lab uh, of the other layers. Yeah, and... Um, it's easier for me to shade based on that, like for my process personally. Christina, I know you're not into audio recording, but uh, people who who record music uh, sound, they have a similar thing with separating a track. That You have one voice, one instrument on a track, and that way it's it's not connected to the other ones. And if you want to put an effect on it or turn it down, you can do it independently of affecting the other ones. But there's also the, t the time where everything is on one layer, everything is joined together. And then when you use the liquify tool, it's going to affect everything. So that's true. Yeah. You, you get a final mix of music. And then at some point you may put an effect over the whole mix and you don't have the option of separating things out. But I'm watching how many of these layers you've got. And my first response <laughs> in student mode is, doesn't that get so complicated that it distracts you? And it doesn't seem like it gets you distracted at all. It seems like you really know your way around with these layers. Is it just because you're in motion? And um, well, Honestly, I I should be, you know, when I when I work, um, I am not as organized sometimes, and it's something I have to actively work towards. Mm. So when I work in this way, I try to group everything so that I know where it is. Um, but if you, here's a little Photoshop trick. If you control and right click, yeah. you can see what layers right. are available where you're clicking. So you can get it really fast. And it doesn't even make any difference what name it is. You know that that's the arm because you're clicking on it. And if it overlaps with something else, then you got to make a choice, right? Yeah. So I can see it's in the, if I want the gloves, I'll go into layer 24 because that's in the gloves group. If I want the arms, I'll go here. Okay. And then another trick is if you have the move tool selected, I learned this from <laughs> my work friend Scratch again. Um, if you uh, control and click, while having the move tool selected, it'll select what you're clicking on. I see. So fun little tip out there for anyone who didn't know that. It's sort of like watching a, uh, a person who flies a, a jet and they've got control panels. And if you are not initiated into that control panel, it is beyond comprehension. But when you are so familiar with this territory, it becomes subconscious. Yeah, um, I think that, I think I would prefer to be more organized generally, but sometimes on jobs that I've been on, like in commercials, 
like when I was doing paintings in an hour, like I had to do a full painting in like 45 minutes to an hour, mm -hmm. it was much easier to just like repaint something um, or like just keep on making layers and paint um, on top instead of like going back and trying to edit something. Sometimes it was just much faster. So I got into kind of a not so great process of yeah. just making a bunch of layers. And I try not to do that as much now. Yeah. <clears throat> so through pain, you adjust. Is that, is that uh color template? Is, is that all of those color swatches up there? Those are your personal ones. Um, Somebody taught me a trick once where you can bring in a photo and build a color swatch list out of it. Mm -hmm. um, so some of these are things that I think I used for that. These are really old, so um, I don't really remember where I got them. But some of these are built from like pictures that I like the mood. And you drop it into Photoshop and it will build a, a color list for you. Wow. Of... So you, you got a palette from nature immediately. Yeah, like you could do that. You could bring in like a master painting and get the color swatches from it too. It's really fun. But. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's like old times. <laughs> but this is like, you know, this is the planning stage, so. This isn't the most necessarily the most fun stage, but it's going to get really fun when I can start actually painting it. Okay, I want to make sure I understand that. This is when you say this is the planning stage. You are you are setting stuff up right now. You've got a design and you're setting stuff up to turn it into its look. Mm -hmm. I'm just setting it up so that I can go through quickly and finish this character before our time runs out. <laughs> wow. So now what I'm doing for anyone who wants to learn this trick who doesn't know it already, if you press Alt, you know, you get the color swatcher. And then if you hold Alt and go, hold Alt and click and go to your other screen, oh, it's really, I wish I could show it here, but if you hold Alt and go to your other screen, you can continue to color swatch outside of Photoshop. So I have my reference page with my little characters and I'm color swatching from them right now. Hey, hey, Cena is here. Cena? Cena is here, yeah. He's in the chat? Cena's in the chat. It says, so surreal to see my friends on this stream. <laughs> <laughs> Cena, it's kind of surreal to see you in the chat. And oh it's my interesting. Gosh. Your, your name is there. Wow. It's, I know, Cena. It's family reunion time. I miss Cena. Cena is one of my Dearest friends. Sina Janani. Yeah, Sina and I have met in your class, Marshall. That's right. We watched a lot of movies together. We did. I actually missed that a lot. I missed that a lot too. Christina, every time I watch a movie, I feel like Christina should see that. Oh, no, we'll spare Christina this one. But yeah, we, <laughs> for, for those who are are we're, we're not in there, we we did about almost a hundred. I think it was it. I stopped counting around eighty-seven uh, Saturday film nights at the community college because we had a room that had a big screen and it was a completely dark room. It was a little theater room, art history lecture hall, and starting around two thousand. Whenever it was, 2015, 14, 15, somewhere around there. We did it for about three years. We just watched movies because we wanted to watch movies. And I remember particular movies that you and I laughed at and other people didn't think were funny. <laughs> what was, there was one that we what? laughed so hard at the intro, but I don't remember. It I was Hail forget. Caesar. It was the opening of Hail Caesar and it was the Universal Studios logo. And it was with choral music. It was with wonderful, haunting choral music. And nobody else thought it was funny. <laughs> and I thought it was funny because of the juxtaposition. And I've since watched it. It, it is funny. It's, it, was, it, was, it was beautiful, but it was so beautiful. And in its strangeness, it was, it was amusing. But a lot of people just didn't pick up on it, I think. Was it supposed and, uh, to be funny? 
that happened with so, uh, a few others too. That there were there were, I think there was some humor in some of those movies that was too dry, for <laughs> a, a mainstream audience. But let's see. I remember I remember watching. We watched. Uh, several of the early Universal Studios horror films, the ones from the early 30s, we watched. Uh, I know you were there when we watched Dracula. And you might have been there when we watched The Mummy and and uh, The Invisible Man. But Dracula, I remember, because when it was over, watching something shot in 1931, where when the camera moved, it was like moving something as heavy as a refrigerator. And when you watch it on a big screen in high resolution, you can feel that they are moving this huge, heavy camera. It goes, oh, it's so hard to move it, but they needed that move to get the effect. And then when it's over, we realize we're sitting in a room where we've all got smartphones and we have access to 4K cameras and we have we have tripods and and we just we can make movies better than they could make movies. And you said you said, I don't something like I don't see why we shouldn't be doing this. <laughs> Shortly thereafter, there was a well-known filmmaker who wrote an essay uh, that he posted on the internet, it says, now is the time when there is no excuse not to be making films on weekends with friends. I feel like that's kind of true. I mean, you can see it with the indie movement. I mean, yeah, indie I games are amazing now. Everything, it's amazing. We are just, this is the most incredible time to be alive. In fact, just watching what you're doing here, can you imagine if you had, if, if an artist from 50 years ago had seen this, let alone 100 years ago. Uh, I remember in 1983 or four, somewhere around there, there was a, a show at the Anaheim Convention Center of what digital art, there was a, this company called Quantel. They had the Quantel Domino and the Quantel something else. And this was before anybody could do computer graphics in their home. And you could spend a half a million dollars. I think the cheapest one was a quarter of a million dollars uh, to to have one of these machines that allowed you to do a kind of what Photoshop did. I got to go to that with Rick Griffin. He said, "This is the wave of the future. This is the wave of the future. This is the way everyone's going to be making art." And watching somebody show on a screen a big eye—it was a close-up of an eye and then retouch it by touching a few things on it, it was hard not to gasp to think that the flexibility with picture making that is ahead, and now that age is full on here, and we, and all of us who are watching Christina work, <laughs> are observing the miracle. This is indistinguishable from magic. It's crazy. I'm... Uh... You know, I I always make myself feel guilty because we do have all those tools available to us. And sometimes it's just, you know, you make excuses like you're tired or you did this today and you don't feel like doing anything else today. And But we really do have, you know, the power to make these things at our fingertips. I mean, like Unity is an amazing program that I only just started working in um, a little bit. Tell us about it. Um, well, again, like I don't have that much knowledge in it, but I had to, you know, work in it a bit for what I was hired for at um, ZeniMax Online. And it's a program where like you make games in it. Um, and it's just, it's so cool when you, you make an asset an asset being like a, a prop or something and you stick it in and you can move it around and it's moving in this space with like light affecting it. And um, it's just really cool, but so yeah. It's a, it's a virtual world. Um, it's a pro it's a program. Yeah. It, it, but it's a program where you're creating a virtual world so you can put characters, props, uh, environments, textures, lights. Yeah. Um, you can, there's a bunch of tutorials, free tutorials out there too, that introduces you to how to do that. And 
You can even get your own assets or download. You can download assets from online. They even provide them for you in the tutorials, I, I think. And you can learn how to like put things into the program and make a level and design, like give, like code a character, um, how they run, how they, their attack sequence and stuff like that. Um, so if anyone has interest, Unity could be an, a cool place to start. Well, I, I know people who use it. I know very little about it. I've kind of gathered that it's it's an umbrella pro. It's not like where you do one thing in it. You've got a whole bunch of things that go into it. So it's, it, like you said, assets are the stuff you put into the game. This is a thing that manages all of them. And I'm trying to find a, a, a metaphor that helps me understand a virtual world, an umbrella program, a... Uh, is it a set? You can download sets for it. So sets um, go in it. It is it's it's bigger than a set. Yeah, it's like it's yeah, it's a it's a game making program. Okay. That you can download like sets and different things. It's kind of, I think maybe the closest thing I could think of is like Maya, where you can download um 3D models off the internet. Except that with Maya, you can't actually make the game in Maya completely, right? Whereas with Unity, you can? I don't think you can in Maya, but to be honest, I'm not sure. Christian, John, you got, do you know? or is, What's a simple way if you were to hide? Luca's here. Luca Cassandra is here. I never get tired of Marshall. She's a great friend of person. <laughs> uh, oh, is Cass here? Uh, or is that a different Cass? No, it's a, uh, well, I don't know. I don't know whether... Oh. <laughs> uh, Luca Cassandra. Let's see. Oh, okay. If anyone has a way of of explaining what Unreal is to the eleven year old with the fewest possible words, that it's like a sandbox, that it's some something that helps us to put it into context with the the other the many other programs. Um, I think sandbox is it. Yeah, yeah. Aries mod. <laughs> Am I using dated language just by calling it a program? Are you supposed to call it an app now? What is the difference? It, 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 it's it's a game engine technically. It's an um, engine, okay. Yeah, well, a game engine specifically, but it okay. lately it's been used for other things. So, yeah. um, all of the Mandalorian TV show was shot. Uh, a lot of it was shot in Unreal, actually. The backgrounds. So they were in front of a, a some kind of digital green screen kind of thing, and the actors would act. Uh, in a scene, but it would be like you're in a spaceport or in a, you know. Uh, so does it composite? Uh, yeah, so, so it's like real real time rendering. Um, so you can have a character in a scene, and it, it without pre rendering or anything, it'll display what it actually, you know, look like, um, as, you know, as like a movie asset in real time. Um, uh, a, a drama Jurabev actually uh, works works in that. Um, okay, I, I got one. Luca gave us a good one. Unreal and Unity. For one thing, R Unity and Unreal apparently are are have similar functions. And then Luca uh, boils it down to Unreal and Unity are a one-stop shop for making games. That helps. Yeah. One-stop yeah. shop. That sounds like a... Everything else can go into that shop. If it's a shop, you can have a thousand different items in it. But you don't have to go anywhere else because you've got everything in there. Yeah. Engine is a little difficult for a person who doesn't know what an engine is already, how the metaphor is already used. Game engine, it takes care of all the hard things like lighting in real time. Real time simulation can simulate whatever you want concerning you can code it in. Okay, so you're learning this, huh? Um, I had to learn a little bit of it when I started working at um, when I started working and yeah. but we but I don't use it as much now for what I'm doing. Well, it seems like everybody that's in the industry is learning Unreal or Unity. And also, it seems like Blender is really becoming popular mm -hmm. as a modeling program. Yeah, I've heard so many good things about Blender, and I've seen people use it to get stuff at work done. Yeah, I know um, professionals that are, are just sort of switching over to it, say, oh, yes, yeah, oh, it's great. Yeah, for sure, yeah. 
I, I haven't touched it myself, but I've seen some things people can do with it. Oh gosh, I wish I remembered his name. That One of your students actually, I think, works in it and I see him post stuff on Instagram. He does like, he did some Zelda stuff that I thought was really cool. Kay makes things, says uh, Unreal and Unity, the, the Walmart of game making. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what to make of that. Um, well, I, 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 I guess it's like a one-stop. You know, it is a one-stop shop for everything. It, the way I think the way Unity was founded is that there was a game company that uh, they tried making a bunch of games, and then they realized they have an entire backlog of tools that they developed to make video games. So they essentially just put the that tool set into. Um, a program Unity, and then sold that as a product. Um, so. uh, sorry for me to uh, pull it away from Unity. I want to pull it toward what what yeah. Christina is doing with these. It's, a, it's essentially a cut paper, a cut construction paper look, and you're going in there and making little cast shadows, mm -hmm. and you're also able to just suddenly bleach out. You got the dark gray construction paper and you can move a slider and bleach it out so that it becomes really light gray. And you can you can mess around with all sorts of options, but you are now in the gray dating tone and little hints of three dimensionality with overlaps and cast shadows phase. Yeah, I, I, um, I was messing with it because I wanted to see if I could differentiate it a little bit more from the vest. This is something I should have done sooner, actually. I should have flipped it horizontally. Um, Do you, any, are you in the habit of flipping it horizontally? Um, I try to be. Sometimes I get so wrapped up in stuff that I forget, but it's a good yeah. practice because um, your eyes can get used to what you're seeing and you don't see things that look weird. Yeah. I mean, this character looks so weird anyway. That, like, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> right, but you 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 want to manufacture the weirdness according to your aesthetic. You want you want to look at it. So the turning it upside down, flipping it, uh, those things help you see it freshly. Yeah, it does. It helps a lot. I don't want to make um, her eyes bulge out. Like that. We, we we've uh, accumulated some questions on the web page. Um, Parker.com slash 613. Uh, would you guys like to hear them? Sure. Cool. Um, uh, Mary2020 asks, uh, how much should I spend every day for study and for fun drawing, or should I do one study and one fun drawing? Uh, or one day study, one day fun drawing, uh, AKA character design. Um, I can't really answer a should because I think it changes for everyone. Yeah. I think one of the big things about getting better at art is learning how you learn best. Um, so it's kind of weird. You have to first learn about yourself before, like you can really maximize how well you learn something. Um, so for me, you know, like a lot of people do master studies and stuff and um, that is helpful. But for me, I found over time that when I, took one specific thing from a master drawing or an artist that I admired. If I took that one specific thing and applied it to something that was like my own, just kind of like my own personal thing, like, um, like for example, if I saw an artist who did like a hatching technique for a character, um, I would design a character and then try to emulate that hatching technique to learn it. Um, so in that way, I kept interest in what I was doing because I found that like just copying the master drawings, I wasn't retaining the information as much. Yeah. Um, so doing it that way was kind of like the equivalent of, you know, like they say, when you are listening to a lecture, when you write notes, you kind of etch it into your brain a little bit better. Mm -hmm. That was kind of the equivalent for me is applying it to my own drawing because I was seeing an immediate effect of how it how I would be applying it. Um, and I found that really helpful. So I don't think like, and I, and I noticed people would guilt themselves a lot over not doing master drawings. Um, 
<laughs> so, so just I, I think having fun with something is going to make you learn it better. So you want to yeah, yeah. find the things. At least I think that like finding the things that you have fun with will help right. you to learn. Absolutely, yeah. Like finding the thing that you don't have to force yourself to do. You know, it's like if you have to force yourself to do figure studies and anatomy studies, I suspect that in the long term you're you're not going to do them enough really to, um, I guess, get really really good at it. So if you don't, you know, if you enjoy drawing as much as you enjoy video games, you'll probably draw a lot. I think. Yeah, and and like one thing that um, that helps too, like I took anatomy with Marshall, and I learned a lot in that. But over time, I found I was getting rusty again. So I found that like if I was doing a character like this, then I would pay attention to like I would brush up on anatomy of the arm. And then maybe pay attention to how I was treating the anatomy in the arm. Like you can make it, you can make it fun by adding it to something that you're doing. Yeah. That just seems the best way to go about it. That it is not taking master studies as somehow it's a painful medicine that I have to do because the teacher said I have to, is just one of the worst ways to go about it. It's, and also it's not the way, it's not a natural way to go about it. The natural way to go about it is to get excited about what some really good artist does mm -hmm. and then figure yeah. how do they do that? And one way to figure out how they do it, maybe the best way to figure out how they do it is to look at it and try to copy it. And then if that isn't, quite getting there finding a teacher will say notice this notice that and then you've got a new thing you can do in your own i mean what would be the point of hey here here's a an example of it from from one of the greatest songwriters of the second half of the 20th century into, into now who just died a few weeks ago stephen sondheim he said that he always liked bach but it was not until he i, I he must have been in his 20s it was not until Milton Babbitt, uh, who was an electronic musician and, and a brilliant music uh, theorist, worked with him to analyze uh, a piece of Bach's work. And he said that that analysis to see mathematically what Bach was doing uh, opened his mind to it. He said he always responded well to Bach, but he said, now Bach makes me cry. And yeah. Sondheim's music is nothing like Bach. It's much more like Ravel, Prokofiev, Stravinsky, 20th century composers, not, not uh, 18th and, and, and 17th century composers. Uh, but yet he saw in there by studying how meticulously, consciously managed the music was for emotional effect and he extracted the lesson from that, that my songs can be that way too. So yeah, when, you, yeah. when you hear something you love, when you see something you love, when you find that you look at an artist who takes your breath away, to take several hours, maybe, maybe 10 or 20 hours altogether over a period of time, just to understand what that artist is doing compositionally, then the next stage is, or, or even, it shouldn't say the next stage, right along with that stage is, can I use that in my work? Christina, you have done that so, so impressively. Your work does not look like any of your teachers. It does not look like any of the masters who you have adopted. You simply took from them what appealed to you and you you seem like you learned how to learn and, and how to discern. Yeah, I, I think that it's normal when you're starting out to like do a lot of copying and that's fine. Um, I think when I first started school, like I didn't, I didn't know, or I was too like strong willed to listen. Um, but I think when you like open up your mind to the way that other people do things and especially to critique, like critique is, the most helpful thing, even if you disagree with it, um, because we get stuck in our own mindsets. And if somebody like gives you a suggestion, like even if you you know don't want to hear it, 
you might think later on, hmm, I wonder why they said that. And that might stick with you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Good point. Christina, again, I, I'm, I know that I'm, I'm showering compliments here, but you always have a great <laughs> attitude toward critiques. I, I remember just watching your emotional countenance is that you took it seriously, even if even if it was not the critique wasn't on the money. It was something that kicked you into a mode of paying attention to that. That's that attitude of listen to everything and then do what you choose. Yeah. Like, unless it's, you know, your boss and you have to do it. Um, you know, just because someone offers you something or an opinion or whatever, doesn't mean that you have to do it, you know, but if you try it, you might find, you might find that you learn something you didn't really expect. Yeah. Um, I, I, I really like the bulging eyes on this character, Christina. <laughs> You're really funny. You know, I kind of like the way it's it's turning out. Um, I want to add yeah. some of the stuff that people suggested because I thought those were really fun ideas. I want to look up what singed hair looks like. I'm kind of afraid, though. Yeah, that's one of the things that when you look up, when you look up stuff like that, it's going to affect your emotional moments. Yeah, yeah, here. Yeah. Being. I actually, hmm. so um, one of my friends did um, designs for, I think it was Call of Duty or some other thing that was really gruesome. I, maybe it wasn't Call of Duty because I don't think that's especially gruesome if I remember correctly, but it was, they had to look up a lot of like, I don't want to get depressing, but like deceased people to see how they would rot away so yeah. i mean looking at reference can be stressful yeah for sure um but anyway back to <laughs> yeah I, well, I remember had uh, a colleague who who we've talked about quite a bit christina in fact i think we've laughed harder in telling stories about that colleague than any other human being so you know who i'm talking about right uh where we would we the, I, I won't go anymore for who it is, but he he told me uh, back in the late '90s when I did some particular drawings in my sketchbook, he said, uh, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, you're starting to get it. You're starting to find your style." He said, "You should look at more uh, rotting corpses. You should look at dead meat, at, at rotting meat. Rotting meat would really help you." And I thought, I don't know that I want to spend a lot of time looking at rotting meat so that it will affect the, the style in which I work. But he was quite excited about it. And you, <laughs> he was excited. <laughs> he was excited about it because that's that was he's got real macabre sensibilities. And, you, you know, that was just part of what what brought the horror. I mean, you, you look at, at Giger's stuff and and. Beksinski and and some others who they are looking at the horrific things of life and they are blending them with other things to make a new thing that has its own horrific quality with Giger it's really obvious it's 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 dead flesh and machinery and and sex he gets those three going together and so there's just you you get combinations of things nobody else has put together and it it gets emotional responses you've got a lot of cut paper going on in yours yeah there's a lot going on and as you were talking and we were talking about people and the grotesque reference like i went more with the uh, the singed idea that someone had and thinking about how this hair is intact here mm. made me keep the eyelashes intact here like it's singed the side of her face, kind of, I guess, the hair on the side of her face. But since you've got paper stuff going on in there, then that would mean that the way ed, uh, burnt edges on paper could be part of it. Is that right? That Is that what a, you're thinking? Yeah, that could um, be a cool idea. It wasn't what I was thinking, but that's a really great idea, actually. Do you know Stephen Gamble's work? I don't think so. Somebody look up Stephen Gamble. I think it's G. If Stephen is with a PH, I think, and G A M M E L L. He does horror for children, uh, young adults. Um, yeah, yeah. Look at the look at the torn paper. Everything looks like shredded, ripped, torn paper stuff. Oh wow! Yeah, that's terrifying. And, and so it's it's telling a kid 
You want, you want, you, you think, you think you can't be torn apart. You just come into this world and you'll watch out. They'll rip you apart like Kleenex. It is a, uh, it's a very uh, effective aesthetic. Yeah. It looks like they did scary stories to tell in the dark. Yeah. 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 I think he did. I think oh he did scary gosh. stories to tell in the dark. Right. But that, that movie came out recently too. And they did it. They had a character who looked like this. Mm -hmm. That's the torn paper metaphor for creating an atmosphere yours is not torn paper yours is is a uh, a kid crafts person who has has uh has real craft with ca cutting out the pieces of paper precisely but also has real uh, daring and uh, crazy unrestraint for what the proportions will be I'm going to make a picture of a person. I'm going to make their head this big. I'm going to make their fingers this small. And there's a daring in your design choices. Uh, this is, I mean, I never really delved too much into his work, but I really love how, uh, like, the juxtaposition between the rendered areas and the flat areas. Um, where, there was a picture here that I really liked. It was a lady, lady's dress with coat hangers. Oh, gosh, I lost Yeah. Here oh, it is. It's, it's happening right now. Christina is opening up this, the the design <laughs> elements of Stephen Gamble's illustrations. I just love that. Like it's yeah. like this area is completely rendered, and then he left out any line here, and then this is just pure line. Yeah, but it's flat. Good observation. Really cool. Yin Yang stuff. Wow. And then you pull it away and you've got, now we've got the <laughs> uh, crazy a, whole, a whole different look. Yeah. But yet you've still got things. You've got the flat shapes going on and the thin lines and the tone. You've got the bombs on the head that are shapes and then they, they segue into lines, S similar things going on. I mean, we figure line and tone are such basic elements in a picture. How can you not be composing with them? Oh, well, that's true. You're calling attention to how. That's one thing that I like about the lasso tool is I start, um, I start with the lasso tool helping me to have freedom and I can either allow it to continue out of hand or to reel it in more if I want to. Cause I could, you know, I could, this is a flat shape when you look at the silhouette, but I can add, you know, musculature to it if I really want to. And I might add elements of that as I go, like how there might be a, a, a bit of a, oops, maybe there's a bit of an overlap there. Yeah, look at that. You're bringing, you're using it, you're using it. People would not look at that and say, hey, here's someone who studied anatomy. And yet the little whisper you did of that shape shows that that ridge group, that forearm group of muscles is in front of the upper arm. Yeah. Uh, you're, you're also putting so much energy into what Molly Bang makes a big deal out of in teaching how to compose. I it's, love her book. Yeah. She's all about boil it down to shapes. And the rendering, which will be part of, rendering ends up being part of shape mat, uh, language because when you put core shadows in there, you look, look how you put those shadows in there, they become shapes. But even if you render it all the way through to the point of where you're rendering like a, a realist, you're still creating shapes. I want to bring it up because you mentioned it. And um, this book was so helpful. And it's such an easy read, too. Yeah. Um, sorry, I lost my, my stream. There it is. OK. Yeah, I, I really like this one. I think you actually, I don't know who did. I think it might have been you who, who brought this up to us yeah. in class. This, this is the this is the most important book on composition that I know. I, it is the best book on composition that I know of. And that is not to say that there aren't some other good books, but she, in a matter of, to an 11 year old, you would understand what you need. And she was very succinct about it. And she even spends the first half of the book showing you how she makes a decision to do, to solve a problem and how it creates a new problem. 
and navigating through, which is what all composition comes down to that. I like it. Mm, I don't like it completely. Mm, I'd like it better if I did that. Oh, I like that. Mm, I don't like this about it. That is the whole dynamic of composition. And making it any more complicated than that starts to make it more complicated than that. It's com composing. If, sometimes people get it when they compare it to music. What are the rules I'm supposed to follow if I make up a song? Well, I watched a two-year-old make up songs, and I watched him make up songs when he was two and three and four and five, and I don't remember him ever asking about a rule. He would just make up a song, and he made up some songs that to this day still resonate with me, or at least the hooks. He didn't know how to actually compose an entire song and do all of the work of a prof professional songwriter, but he knew how to compose. And Molly Bang, in her book, Picture This, boils down composition to very few elements and principles, the most useful ones, really. Mm -hmm. And if, if you want the other, since we're, we're making suggestions for students, if you want the other great wisdom on composition, you've already heard me talk about it for hours. It's uh, Writing the Natural Way where she elaborates for a full thick book on what those principles are. But Molly Bang is for the 11 year old and Gabriel Rico, who wrote the writing for the natural way is for the high school student or the college student for principles of composition. But back to Molly Bang, it all comes down to, I don't like it that way. Mm, I'd like it better this way. Ooh, I like this. Mm, it could be better. No, that's good enough. I like it. That's the whole dynamic of the process of composing. I'm yeah. so glad you you appreciate that book, Christina. It's just it is becoming. I think it's there. There's a surge of interest, a resurgence of interest in it. Yeah, I really like it because um, because like you said, she makes it easily accessible for people of all ages. So it's not like it. It's not a pretentious read or anything like that. Um, you can go through it in maybe you know a fifteen minute setting if you wanted to, and still understand the principles. Um, and and she gives examples of like what makes what makes a a shape scary. What makes a shape like things that you intrinsically know? She puts into words. Well, you're doing it with little sharp shapes right now. You've got you've got your her her wolf's teeth in there, and your and the uh, the otter pop blue of the skin that she needs her braces though. I gotta still add those in there. So I heard you say before I came in that you had braces as a kid for many years. Yes. I had extra teeth. I had teeth that were behind each other. Um, wow. I had to get a couple of teeth. I had, yeah, I had lots of lots of teeth. Work. Too many teeth. Too many cooks. <laughs> oh, geez. Uh, are, are you familiar with too many cooks, Marshall? Christian, you you asked me that when we were driving up. To, uh, <laughs> Oh, yeah. yes. We had a conversation about it. I, I am familiar with too many cooks. Yeah. I think I think people are probably better off not knowing what too many cooks is. Yeah, I think it might. We can change the subject and bring it back to Christina's yeah. artwork. Yeah. I feel just going going off on uh, on book reports uh, of Molly Bang and, and Gabriel Rico is was a little gratuitous because we are watching Christina and and, uh, uh, there, are, there are some questions from the chat as well. Oh, I would love to answer some questions. Uh, Luca Cassandra Carver asks, hey, Christina, I'm not sure if I missed this, uh, but I was going to ask what artists you saw, uh, what artists gave you a big aha moment? Um, David Coleman did. Um, he was... I think he reviewed my portfolio in a more public setting for the first time. And I realized I wasn't very good. I was the worst out of everyone reviewed. So that was a big aha moment. Like, oh, I need to really step up my game. But on a more positive note, um, 
I also watched his DVD. Um, I forget which one it was, but character, the one on character design. Yeah, I think it's in two parts. Yeah, and it might have a penguin on it. Yeah, I've got it queued up right behind me, behind this bookshelf. I've got it on a on a computer over there queued up. I'm going through it right now. I I but. really really like it because he works on. Um, I think he works on tracing paper, and um, I was at the time having trouble going from silhouette to line drawing to finished because I was trying to hold myself too much to the silhouette and the line, um, like the original sketch. I was trying to hold that, hold too much to it when I was refining it. And one thing he said in there was when you're, what, like when, I, I don't want to quote exactly, I don't, because I don't remember it, but it was essentially when you're going, when you're drawing on top to refine your drawing, the goal isn't to copy it completely, but to make better lines. Um, and that really resonated with me because I was really having problems with that at the time. And so instead of, I think that still holds in my art today is I'm not trying to keep true to, I mean, look at the original here. It's very, very different. Um, like I'm not trying to necessarily keep true to that unless there's a quality um, about it that I want to keep true to, um, like the bomb idea or something. But the goal is to have those those lines um, every time you draw them to to feel better than they were before. You have something in common with David Coleman. No, I, I don't mean artistically. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, just having observed you, is that, was it, did he give you that critique at our school? He did, yeah, in yeah, um, yeah. Jim's class. Right. In, in, uh, uh, he, he emphasized when he made that presentation uh, that how hard he worked how many hours he put into getting his craft up. It was, I, I, I think it was a little sobering to some students to, because he, he made such a big deal out of it, but it was such a good influence to let everybody know this did not happen easy. I had to work, 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 get up early in the morning, stay up late at night to get my craft up. And Christina, that is exactly what I observed in you. When you were in those classes, the amount of work you put into the projects to make them all they could be. And the conscientiousness about it really echoed that. Yeah, and I think, oh, go ahead, go ahead. You, no, you go ahead. Oh, I think that um, like it's it's very easy to just like, like put in the, the minimal amount of work and like get an assignment done because in art, you're not really like graded on how good it is. Mm -hmm. um, but it's like really what you want to get out of it. So if you're going into it saying, you know, I can skate by with this, it's not really going to help you in the end. Yeah. But yeah, um, he didn't give me a bad review or anything. I just want to put that out there. Like he didn't, he wasn't mean in any way. Like he's one of the, the nicest artists yeah. that I've met um, that I, that I'm not like, um, like, in his inner circle or anything. Um, like as a student, he was very, very nice to me. And um, and yeah, just during that critique, I just like realized that as I was looking at it, I was kind of in a third person state of mind, like, oh my gosh, I'm seeing my stuff up here. And I know he's being nice because he's a kind person while also being as critical as you can be while being kind. Yeah. Um, and that was a very healthy wake up call for me. I noticed a theme with him in critiquing students is how often he said, he used the phrase, push the forms, is that there is often a timidity in pushing the forms until someone who works at his level tells you, you got to be more daring. You, you can push the forms more. You can you could experiment more with this. And boy, that that took with you. Yeah, it really did. And it helped too that I had um, there was a period of time where like 
um, other students at school were very, like we were very comfortable giving positive to critique to each other. Like one of them was Jonathan King. And yeah. I always really valued his critique because he was always very honest, uh -huh. but very positive. <laughs> um, like one time I had a sketchbook and I don't even know if he knows how much I valued his critique, but it's stuck with me for a long time. <laughs> but um, I had a sketchbook and I was trying way too hard to make it look good. And he called me out on it and he's like, why, you know, a sketchbook isn't there for that. It's for you to learn in. And it helps to have your peers be critical with you in a kind way. I want to see if I've got any of his work on my computer on this computer. This is not my computer. This is the, uh, yeah, Jonathan was a hard worker too, really. Yeah. He really enjoyed the process of learning. Yeah. That's one thing I remember. I haven't talked to him in, a, in quite a while, but I will always remember him fondly. How are we doing for time, Christian? Um, so we probably have about 15 to 25 more minutes or so. How are you feeling, Christina? I'm feeling pretty good. Nice. Yeah, this is awesome. Does anyone have any like questions that I didn't answer yet? Yeah, yeah, that there are a bunch in the in the chat. Or I'd love to answer some page. more of those. Let's see. Um, how has Art Block affected your professional career? Oh gosh. Um some of it was self-imposed and some of it wasn't um i um spent a little bit too much time behind the computer drawing at one point and caused an injury to myself um i had tendonitis and i could not lift a pencil without my hand my arms and hands feeling um tired so like in that way i had a an art block that I really couldn't do anything about, but I, I still went to class and my teachers were really nice and everything and understanding. Um, I actually got it in the middle of a school year. Um, yeah. And then, you know, when you work on professional work, um, well, actually before I go into that, um, it's, it's super, I, I know it's like, you never think it's going to happen to you, but it's good to, it's good to sh do your stretches and like, you know, you want to do some things that stretch out your tendons and things like that and make sure that your area is ergonomic, that you get up for a lot of breaks because at some point it'll catch up with you. Um, so just be careful with that sort of thing. And then, um, at least like, that's my opinion. I, I, I think people should be careful with it. Um, and then after I was doing commercials, they're very, um, it was very like on. And so I would spend like the whole day working with, um, one of my freelance bosses that I really like, uh, his name is Misko Iho. And we would work in a way where he would have a lot of input while I was drawing and we got stuff done really quickly that way. But after we were done with the project, um, I felt um, like I had lost my style in a, a little way because I was working in the style of the commercial for the first time. Mm, yeah. And I didn't know how to get it back. Um, and I actually went, that's, I think that's when I took the expressive drawing class, I felt really lost with my style. Like I was felt like I tried to em emulate my own style and trying to get back into it. Now, wh which commercial are you referring to? Um, the, the first Target one I did after I was done with it, yeah. I felt like I forgot how to work in yeah. the style that I had cultivated. Yeah, the professional demands made it so that you, you met the professional demands. It pulled you away. And then, uh, Christina, that was, I am just so happy that you took that expressive drawing class. I'm going to make it public. You know, where I'm teaching it, I'm teaching the, this coming semester. I just, I just finished teaching it. I had a wonderful group. They responded <sighs> to your work. 
I had several students in there that did some of the most incredible work I've ever seen. I'm doing Did you it. have Eric in that class? Who? Eric, Eric? His name was Eric? No, I don't I don't think there was no, there was not an Eric in that class. Oh, okay. Uh, but there was Debbie Wachel and Deborah Espinoza. Uh, anyway, I'm uh, I'm doing it again. This this uh, Victoria uh, Victoria might be in here uh, right now. Victoria Dre. Um, we are we're offering it again. It's on Saturdays. If you can't if you can't take a junior college class, if you're not in California, where if you're outside of California, it costs a lot of money. If you're in California and you want to take a junior college class with me. Uh, F U L L C O L L dot E D U. I'm teaching expressive drawing. It's hey, I should warn you, you're taking it at a community college, so I have to grade you, which changes the dynamic. And some students who love me uh, grow not to love me when I have to grade, um, because I grade objectively. But if you can't take it at the junior college, I have every intent of making this a public course uh, within a year to where we'll do an expressive drawing course like we've done the Bridgman course and the composition course and the other ones that we just finished. Um, and I'll show them your work, Christina. Oh, thank you. You you experimented and experimented and experimented and then found, you, you sort of evolved, didn't you? Mm -hmm. I got a lot of techniques from that class that... Um especially with like traditional media that I still enjoy using, especially with ink work. Yeah, you did that. You, you actually put some feathers onto paper or, or some other things that, yeah, they, I've never seen anybody do before. Yeah, that was really fun. If, if you're out there and you haven't taken a class with Marshall, I would highly, I don't want to make you uncomfortable Marshall, but I mean, like the first class I took with you, it changed my life. And I think, it's possible that it could do the same for someone else. So <laughs> if you can take a class with Marshall, there's okay, a lot so of this, inspiration. This is my opportunity to plug me is that if you, if you want to take a class with me, go fill out a survey right now about which classes you're interested in. Although we've already made our decisions for January through summer. We're doing a, we're doing a storytelling from master's class in January. And that will be where we go through those four episodes of the Simpsons. Uh, we are doing a Heinrich Klei class that will be March and then not April and then May and then not June and then July. We're going to break it up into Heinrich Klei on anatomy and form, Heinrich Klei on storytelling, Heinrich Klei on technique, pen and ink technique. Ooh. And then that'll segue into expressive drawing. And then I'm doing one other thing. It's still in the works, and it, it, we may change on this. But if, if you go to the survey and you get on my email list, you'll know about it. If you are a beginner, I am getting so many people saying, could you please give me an hour of your time? Can I hire you as a mentor? Can my, my, my daughter or my son is thinking about going into the arts? And I cannot say yes to them. So I am going to probably on January 3rd do a one-hour presentation on uh, going into the arts as a professional for absolute beginners. So if you're not 16 or 17, but you want to imagine being 16 or 16, I'm thinking of going into the arts to be a professional. I'm going to try in one hour to give you the best advice I can give you, real world advice, and it'll cost 10 bucks. So if you're on my email list, you'll know about that uh, at least five days before it happens, maybe a week before it happens. That sounds like an amazing opportunity. But Christina, I, kind of I, want did, to attend. <laughs> I did not come here to plug my, my teaching. I came here because, uh, because of you and it's your birthday and that's already out. People, <laughs> have already, people have already mentioned it in the chat. So I wonder oh. whether you were keeping it a secret, but it's like, no, it's, I, I, I wasn't going to be the one to initiate it. It's sort of like, sorry, I can't make it to your surprise party tomorrow night. <laughs> yep, it's my birthday, and I'm really glad to be here with you guys. And Happy birthday. Thank you. Happy and... birthday. <laughs> that was amazing, Marshall. Hey, somebody's asking, will Christina offer workshops or mentorships within Maryland? Sorry, I couldn't access my Provo account to ask there. I reside within Maryland and was just curious. You've already got a potential friend. Oh, interesting. Who's local. In fact, I have a student who is very involved, 
who uh, is, and she's in in Maryland. I don't know, I don't know where. I think she, yeah, yeah, she's in Maryland. Do you know her? Would well, yeah, I'll, 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 tell, you, I'll, I'll okay. tell you later. She might not want me to to mention who she is. Publicly. That's totally understandable. Uh, but we've already we've already mentioned so many people's names. <laughs> <laughs> we spared a few. Not everybody wants to be wants to have their name mentioned in public. Um. Well, to answer the question, um, I haven't really thought about it. I thought about doing a sketch group. Um, so something a little more informal that I wouldn't mind, uh, you know, like sharing some, like if we go out and draw at a coffee shop or something in a group, um, that could be like a fun little informal workshop thing. But um yeah, I was kind of I was kind of thinking about doing some more videos on like little tips for character design and things like that. So uh, I haven't thought about anything in person yet, but that's not to say it couldn't happen. But you want to do more teaching. I do. Yeah. Well, it's going to happen then. Well, if, if people have an interest, I would love to to do more of these streams. Yeah, people, yeah. So. People have an interest and people will have an interest. <laughs> Yeah, I didn't make this character much of a demolitionist because it should have like I feel like they should have more stuff on their body. But yeah. I feel like when you put the uh, little white outlines around it, it started to hold the piece together. It started to unify it. Do you, do you feel that way? What, I, I haven't been paying attention to what you've been doing for the last <laughs> few minutes because I've I been, haven't either. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So it's been coming out subconsciously. Yeah, all it, it is starting to really hold together in the last few bits, is and that is because of the light outline around there, or the other things that were that all consciously chosen there. Um, I don't know. It could be could be the contrast, like you go to the eyes. So maybe that's what it is. I've just been sort of like honing in on the lighting a little more. Um, I'm trying to like rush it together right yeah. now to to get it done for for people Your deadline. yeah it's the, <laughs> but there is something about an outline that 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 unifies you know you see it Winsor McKay's pen and ink drawing he really thickens up outlines around the shapes thins them up as it goes inside the the image and it's that thickness around it that makes it more graphic. Even like it's like what you do with a silhouette. As soon as the, the moment you make it a silhouette, uh, where it goes all light like that, it holds together. But you don't want it to be a silhouette. It's got all of this thickness, but one outline around there. Yeah, uh, I feel like it. I think yeah. I mean, a lot of this these techniques I've learned from other people over the years. I can't I can't claim it on my own. So. Um, I, I think that's why it's like so important to be a part of a community, whether it's an online community or a in-person community. A lot of my community actually was online even before the pandemic. And I learned so, like, I learned a lot in school, but when I supplemented it with learning from artists from around the world, which is like one of the benefits of Google Hangouts and now yeah. Discord, I guess, um, like my how much I learned just like shot up. It did. Yeah. So I, I was bringing it to school and getting feedback from my teachers on techniques and things that I learned from friends outside of school as well. Um, yeah, so. I remember seeing that happen, that you're st you you were pursuing teachers all over the world for style and your style rocketed when you really poured into that. I think it's where you needed to go to get out of school is to go to the pros that were that had their styles together. That's what people are doing right here right now with you. Yeah, Make like the things that you guys do at Proco is just like it's so amazing. And um, I like to tune in while I'm working sometimes. And um, I love watching the streams. It'll be interesting to see how many people in the in the coming years, if who have watched you, that you're you you might be a little alarmed to see your style coming into other people's style. Oh, that's interesting. I haven't really um, thought about that. It, it happens. <laughs> I, I can ask a couple lightning round questions before the stream ends, oh, sure. if you'd like. 
Sure. Um, where do you seek inspiration for your drawings and in general, what inspires you? Um, let's see, where do I seek inspiration for my drawings? I look a lot at Pinterest and if I have an art block, one of the best things I've learned, I think actually, yeah, I think I learned this from Marshall is sometimes you just have to go and like ingest things on the internet and Pinterest and getting inspiration and, it could be from anything. It could be like the pattern on a leaf or um, movies or um, going out with friends. Like I think like having that balance. Can you repeat the question? <laughs> I feel like I'm going on a tangent. Yeah. Uh, where do you seek inspiration for your drawings and in general what inspires you? Uh, esp well, especially funny things. Funny things inspire me a lot. Like I really feel inspired by um, my friends too, like some of the some of my favorite drawings I've done have had elements of my friends in them. Like, oh, my friend wears a hat like this. I feel like this character would too. So I'm gonna put it on them, and then it's fun to like show them later. Um, so I guess like people inspire me and the connections that I've made with them, um, yeah. and it gives me like a real life reference. Right. Nice. Cool. Um, then. Uh, one point of character design I struggle with is finding out uh, mostly in co is costume design. Uh, how do you go about figuring out what character should wear what uh, wear without makeup, uh, without it being too bland or going overboard with it? What was the makeup part that they said? How do you figure out about or how do you go about figuring out what the character should wear without makeup? Um, to wear without. Makeup. Without making it too bland, or over going overboard with it. Oh, well, Christ, Christina and 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 Christian, I have to go. Oh, okay. okay. No problem. I'm sorry that I have to go, but uh, thanks for joining, Marshall. Thank it you for great joining. Here. Great seeing you after all this time. Yeah, yeah. it really was. Right. Bye, Marshall. Bye. Bye, Marshall. Um, let's see. To answer that question, um, I think I've always had um difficulty with costume design myself. Um, but at one point I took a costume design class and that really helped me to make more convincing costumes. Um, you kind of learn about the seams and it's been a while since I've like practiced legitimate costume design. Like I've done it a little bit for work, but some of the most important thing about things about costumes is um, where the seams are and like you'd be surprised how much that makes a difference in learning how they're made. Um, you can drape them a lot better. It's kind of like, it's kind of like learning how to, like if you draw the bones of a human, you're, like if you know how to draw the musculature and the skeletal structure of a human, you're going to be able to drape the skin on it. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's kind of like that with clothing. Right. Cool. Um, let's see. Uh, I think we're that's pretty much it on the questions for now um cool. do you uh do you have any other closing thoughts or anything or um thanks everyone for i guess my camera's over here i keep forgetting i'm looking at you um thanks everyone for coming and everyone who asked questions and everyone <clears throat> sorry my voice is dry everyone who came and spending my birthday with me that was really special thanks for having me Cool. Um, be inspired if you want to come to my hopefully future streams you can follow me on Instagram Christina underscore Cornette um, hopefully there will be future things to do on there <laughs> more streams maybe some tips um, and just really appreciate you guys being here <laughs>